Hello there, Mr. Mills. How are you today? Hello. Good, Thomas. How are you? Doing okay. I thank you again for joining us this fine evening. I understand today is the 30th anniversary of Claps Now, and I'm honored you chose us. So, the first question I have is, you have three big milestones this year, one next month, two of them this week. The first is 40th anniversary of your hip Wait, okay. Sorry. Thomas. Yeah? Thomas, slow down just a little bit. Sorry. I heard I only had 10 minutes for this interview. I'm trying to... I had a lot of questions prepared, but... All right. So, first, one to ask you: so We have big three, I mean, three big milestones this year. One next month, two of them this week. The first was your debut single on Hip Tone, that was back in '81, April, and then today, Claps Now turned ten. Actually, no, twenty. Sorry, no, thir I'm sorry. I'm have a, I'm reading off a list. Okay, Claps Now is ten. The end of time is thirty. Hip Tone is forty. There we go. How looking back, what's it like? And then I want to ask you too, so I understand that that original single for Radio Free Europe was edited at WZBC Studio. I was wondering, what do you remember of that night? Uh, my feeling it was, we didn't actually edit it there. What I, because there's no way that you had any sort of the machines for, uh, for that editing. I mean, editing is kind of a process. My guess is what happened was that we were sent maybe uh, a remastering of it that we listened to for the first time and approved that remaster uh, because there's no way that, that uh, you know any college station has the equipment necessary to actually edit the single. Um, and we didn't actually, I don't remember that we did much editing on it. You know, we cut it and we pretty much kept it like it was. The only thing that changes from the time you record it until the time you release it is the, is the actual... Uh, mixing of it so we may have been approving a new mix or we may have been approving a master but i don't think we did any actual editing in the studio okay because that's what i read in the uh the liner notes of the deluxe edition of murmur that's what michael plan recalls it was like 500 copies yeah uh plan we're here it's a shame he couldn't make the interview no, yeah it was, uh, again i don't think there's literally any way you can actually edit it in the studio because there's no equipment to, to chop it to chop it up i mean back in those days thing to well, something I'm dying to ask is that at that time you had three Michaels in one van did it ever get confusing oh there was only two of us I thought uh, Michael says in the line too that he was in the van with you Michael who Plen Yeah, but he was touring with you, right? Um, I think he probably came out to visit us, but he wasn't on tour with us. I mean, we were traveling, you know, four guys, the four band members, and sometimes our manager, uh, sometimes not, in the van. That's five guys in a van, and that's plenty right there. We didn't need another guy. But uh, Plant was out with us occasionally. He was, uh, you know, he was our buddy, and he worked for the record company, so he was around. But uh, really, it was uh, Michael... Bill, Peter, and myself, and then sometimes our former manager was in the van. Yeah. Uh, so as far as Michael and Mike and, and that sort of thing working out, uh, Michael and I agreed early on, the band agreed early on, he would be Michael, I'd be Mike, and, and Clem was just Clem. <laughs> we got around that by calling him by his last name. Ah, uh, okay. Uh, so, I want to ask you a lot of questions, but I really can only just condense it to this. Um, your favorite, what are your favorite two tracks on... Uh, out of time in class into now. I know that you, um, in the past, you said that there are a few record songs that you want to avoid, but looking, but um, what do you, what's your other standouts? Well, you know, I, I don't really listen to our stuff for pleasure. Uh, it's, it's a little too close to home. Yeah. I, I listen to REM stuff. It generally feels like, uh, like work, you know, because I sit there and think about all the things I, 
I should have done or all the things I didn't do. Um, but I tell you, uh, you know, there, there are, I like most of the things on both of those records. Um, I will tell you that, uh, you know, losing my religion certainly turned out well. It went all over the world. It was a hit in, you know, 110 countries or something. And, uh, you know, you got to have a soft spot for that. Um, I always thought Half a World Away turned out really well and out of time. Uh, as far as collapse into now, um, I really like Uberlin, and uh, I believe that um, Every Day is Yours to Win is on Collapse Into Now, and I really love that song. Yeah. I guess the laser thing on Uberlin is absolutely amazing. That was the Korg Monotron, correct? Uh, there's this cool laser sound in Uberlin. They can't get over. I think that's a Korg Monotron, correct? Oh, gosh. You know, yeah. Peter had a bunch of fun toys, and I think uh, Jack Knife Lee, our producer, was bringing in uh, some fun toys at the same time. I don't remember exactly which one we used on that, but but that sounds uh, that sounds right. A little, little bitty chord. Hmm. So another question I ask. So you play a lot of inter- instruments, Miss Mills. You do piano, bass, guitar, accordion, and sousaphone. Do you have a favorite? And then another tangent. I read an interview you did with Rolling Stone. You mentioned a single called Oh Me, at least on Lori Records, and you couldn't find any information about it. Did you ever learn anything else about it that I didn't reach out to you? Because uh, I have some info. No, I can't. I still can't find it. Have you heard about it? Yeah, I just found something, actually. So apparently there are two different releases. One, there was recently released on a record label called Catalina, and it has a green label. And then there's the Lori release, which apparently shaved five seconds off of Oh Me. If you're looking for a copy, I found one. It's on sale at a place called Vinyl Richie Records. I can, forward you, I can email you the link. Yeah, I'm just, uh, I just yeah. When I was younger, and I don't know where it is. Yeah, so uh, yeah, I thought it was pretty cool, interesting. I gotta t- find a copy myself. There's a YouTube stream that I'll probably be listening to. I'll send you that too if you want. But yeah, so apparently there's that's an even really longer version. Yes. Yeah. Um, oh, that, that's very cool, Thomas. I'd really appreciate that. No problem. Um, Okay, another tangential question. So I moderate a site called Equipboard, which tracks musicians' gear. You have a page. And I was wondering, you seem to have, you don't use a lot of effects, but you seem to have an interesting relationship with Electronics Big Muff. It's the only effect you mentioned in your Music Radar interview in 2017, and you used it extensively in the 2000s. What's your relationship with the effect? You know, I find that the bass, because because of the role of the bass in the band, uh, effect can kind of get in the way. Um, I, 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 the, the bass does not really stand out. It's there, to, it's there to provide a melodic bottom for the band. And I, I, I don't just play the root notes, but I, and I do play a lot of melodies. But I like the way it sounds just as a bass. Um, the Big Muff, actually, the one I played is a Russian version called the Big Musky. Um, I did that to get some good fuzz on a couple of songs. But mostly, uh, I just like the bass the way it sounds. I really enjoy playing it. I really enjoy... Uh, you know, rattling dishes off the shelves, if at all possible. Uh, so that's why I play the bass. And uh, you used two different versions of that effect before, correct? Well, um, on the bass, the only pedal I remember plugging in is the Big Musky. Uh, there is a Korg uh, keyboard bass, uh, not keyboard, pedal bass. It's, uh, it's literally like church organ pedals, mm. and you play them, and then you can adjust the sound uh, with the synthesizer that's built into it, but you play it with your feet, so you can stand up and be doing something else, in theory, and then play this uh, these pedals with your feet while you play the bass guitar with your hands or play guitar with your hands, whatever you're doing. Hmm. Okay, and then I'm going to ask you, so regarding the album releases, um, I understand you have an interesting concerto for orchestra and rock. You've been touring, you were touring a little bit before the pandemic. Can we be expecting another one of those in the future? Yeah, we are actually working now on putting together a program for the concerto. 
uh, with uh, it, it's, it's technically called it's concerto for violin, rock band, and string orchestra, and we will be touring that next year with a full program. Uh, the first part of the program we're still working on, but yes, it, it'll be out in public next year for sure. Awesome. And okay, so another back to Delhi ZBC trivia. I understand you also met director Jim McKay one night at a Gang of Four show in NYC. He was one of our former DJs. What are your memories of that night? He said you turned to the studio with a copy of the Hipton single, but I can't find it for the life of me. Um, I, yes, I believe we did meet Jim McKay in Boston one night after uh, being at the station, as I recall. Um, you know, Jim's a great guy, good friend, and he's turned out to be a phenomenally successful director, so talented. Uh, I think we met another friend named Tom Gilroy up there uh, right around that same night or that same time. Um, you know, Boston's always been a really fun place for us. Uh, but we, I've made so many good friends here over the years. Uh, but, you know, it's like they say in Spinal Tap, it's not really a college town. Hmm. Okay. And then another thing. <laughs> yeah. Um, another thing. So it's been about a year since we lost um, your other drummer, Bill Reeflin. I was wondering, do you have any, what are any memories that stand out to you? Since it's we've just celebrated the one year anniversary of the pandemic, being declared a pandemic. Right. Yeah. That's um, that was a major sad day. Uh, he'd been ill for a while, uh, but but that doesn't lessen. Uh, the sadness. He was a great, great guy, an incredible drummer, an incredible musician all the way around. Uh, he could play any number of things, probably better than I can. Hmm. And, uh, and he was a really funny, dry uh, humor uh, person. And I loved him and I miss him. He was, uh, he was really fun to play with. Hmm. And then, okay. So just to get to a later note, ex so on every RM release, except for Around the Sun and Accelerate, there is a unique name for the A and B side, in addition to a fun little copyright notice following the template of administered in so-and-so place by this label. What inspired those Easter eggs? Oh, we were just having fun. Uh, we always, you know, Peter and I were, were kind of record collectors from a long time ago, and it's really fun to, to find these this little minutia on records that that give you an insight into the personalities of the musicians. Um, you know, naming the sides, you know, everybody can call it an A or a B side, and we didn't really feel that one side should be relegated to being a B side. We like to spread the good songs around, and we thought that one side was just as good as the other side, so why denigrate it by calling it a B side? So we would call it a dinner side or a supper side or a fireside and a waterside, whatever we wanted to do just to just to make them sound equal and also to, you know, give ourselves a chuckle every now and again and hopefully, you know, give a chuckle to the people who, who figured those little things out. Yeah. And then, so I'm running out of questions, but the other thing I want to ask, so this is going to be a long shot, but I was just interviewing a band called The Wolf and Cookies last week, and they seem to be an REM magnet. Peter Buck did a single for them back in the day. He wrote a review for the guitarist book, and Jefferson Holt saw one of their shows. And then apparently one night in 85, you and Bill Berry picked them up hitchhiking. It was, you were identifying that band from New York. Their band had just broken down. Do you remember that night? I'm not saying it didn't happen. Uh, it wasn't the sort of thing I would normally do. Maybe if we saw that, that it looked like an actual band who was in trouble, that would have uh, <laughs> that would have persuaded us to pick them up. But I can't swear that I remember that happening. Okay. And then, yeah. Hey guys, I'm so sorry to interrupt. Mike, I just wanted to keep an eye on the time. I don't want you to miss your All right, point. thanks, Kev. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thomas, we got about time for one or two more. So, yeah. Okay, so the last thing is just a general question to ask everyone. What music are you currently listening to? What am I listening to? You know, I, I, uh, I put on shuffle mostly, and I listen to whatever pops up. Um, I just heard a Clem Snide song come on that I really like. Uh, I'm listening to Elizabeth Cook's new record, Aftermath. It's really great. Um, uh, I just heard uh, I'm about to buy Aaron Lee Cashton's new record. It's really good. Um, those are the two that come to mind. Hmm. All right. Well, thank you for your time, and enjoy your day. It's absolutely gorgeous outside, and you have quite a milestone today. So, yeah. Well, thank you, Thomas. I'm looking forward to a good afternoon. I hope you enjoy your day, too. I will. All right. Bye-bye. Have a good one.